little bits of the phrase uh, as we go on. So, so uh, let's play the melody for them again. I want you to listen. Now we're adding a little bit to each phrase on it. And there's a couple of uh, a couple of odd bars going on in there as well uh, before we get to the bridge. <laughs> Placing the rhythm a little bit. When I first started, uh, when I first started writing, there's a, uh, a great drummer and pianist and composer up in Maine named Steve Grover, who actually won the uh, the very first Thelonious Monk um, composer's composition competition rather. Um, and one of the things that he talked to me about compositionally was trying different um, different configurations uh, rhythmically, starting things in a different place. Um, not being afraid to write odd bars, these kinds of things. Um, elongate the phrase sometimes, shorten the phrase up. Um, so these are things that I sort of took to heart. And he also, one of the things that, that he mentioned that I should do is to write down all the different elements that I wanted to have in my compositions. So I did, I wrote down about 20 or 30 different elements that I wanted to have in my compositions. And maybe five years ago, five or six years ago, I found this piece of paper that was about 15 years old. And sure enough, everything that was on that list was now in my compositions. And I hadn't seen the list for probably 15 years. And uh, I sort of looked at it and I, I kind of got chills and I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. So uh, I highly recommend that uh, if you're a composer to write down these different elements that you want to have in your music. You know, influences of, of different uh, world music or, or um, styles, genres, um, influences of, of even certain labels like ECM. Um, Blue Note, you know, or Mac Avenue, whatever it may be. Um, if you want to be funky, if you want to swing, if you want to write a reggae tune, write a reggae tune. Uh, if you want to be rooted in blues music, do that. Um, so just kind of get an idea of, of, of cracking that open. I think it's really important. Uh, and, and I'm a firm believer that, that through composition, uh, you find your voice. And you can sit in a practice room all day and, and work on stuff, but I really believe that, that through composition, you get to hear how you hear music. And if you've got a group, you get to hear how that group realizes that music as well. Um, we usually have a guitar player with us. Uh, he had another gig today that he had to leave for. So we're playing this music now as a quartet with no chordal instrument, which puts us in a different frame of mind as well, but allows us to explore the music in a different way too. Um, uh, it's the same music we've been playing uh, all year, but it's different now without a chordal instrument. So, it, so again, it allows us to crack it open even a little bit further, trying some different, uh, some different things. Um, a lot of times the tunes that we play also have landmarks in them. Like when we went to that bridge, and Bill and I come in, so on and so forth with the hits. So those landmarks, um, they're familiar to us also. If you think about what a landmark is, a landmark is something that's familiar to you. And so if there are landmarks in the music, that not only ties us back into the music and what we're playing, but it also ties the listener in because suddenly there's something that's familiar. And when there's something familiar, it sort of draws you back in. Um, it's sort of like a safe place in a lot of ways. It kind of brings you in, it's like, oh, this is familiar to me, this is uh, a little comfort zone here, and then we can venture back out. As long as we continue to bring you back in, you're with us through the whole piece. And uh, so a lot of the, a lot of the tunes that, uh, that we play have those particular landmarks in them. And uh, in the middle of that also, behind uh, one of the solos, behind Felix's solo. Um, Bill and I are playing parts of a new tune of ours, um, but also of an Ornette Coleman tune um, uh, called Ramblin'. And, uh, uh, so we're trying to throw a bunch of different stuff in there uh, so it keeps it interesting for us uh, as listeners up here, but keeps it interesting for you as listeners out there as well. Um, Should we have to take some questions? Yeah. But let's take a few questions before we play some more. Let's take some questions. Yes, sir. The effect that you're using on your tenor, I mean, like I said, the first one you used, I know you've gone through a couple different ones, but mm -hmm. was it uh, Ottawa or... Yeah, the question was uh, about one of the effects that I'm using on the tenor. The 
it's uh, it's like uh, like a wah wah effect, like wah 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 wah. It's a, it's an envelope filter. It's made by uh, Electroharmonics. It's called the Qtron envelope filter. And the very first time I heard that sound uh, was on a, a Brecker Brothers record called Heavy Metal Bebop. And Mike Brecker was using what was called a Mutron, uh, which I believe was also made by Electroharmonics um, back in the day. And I fell in love with that sound, and I looked, God, I must have looked for 20 years, trying to figure out what was going on and how he was able to get that sound on the tenor sax. And I think I was in Wisconsin one day uh, with the Flectones, and Baylor went to this little music store uh, to get some strings or look for picks or something or other. And so I asked the guy, I said, you know, I said, the, I found out it was a Mutron. So I asked him, I said, uh, um, do you know if they make this piece called the Mutron anymore? And he said, no, he said, that was gone a long time ago. He said, but they, Electroharmonics has just put out a piece called the Qtron. And uh, he said, I've got one here. Why don't you take it to sound check and check it out and see what you can make of it? And, uh, and it changed my life. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds great on baritone uh, uh, as well. Not so much on the higher pitched instruments because uh, the envelope has to open enough uh, to give a little more depth to the sound. It changes the way I play also. It changes the way I articulate. Uh, it changes the dynamics of each note. I'll give you a little, a little, little example of it here. I can sound like a helicopter. <laughs> 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 but you can hear what I'll do is I'll go back and forth between the regular sound. <laughs> So the more, the more I push dynamically, if I'm just playing at one dynamic level, you get at the very beginning of the note. But if I'm, if I'm changing the dynamics within the note, so it comes partially with me pushing air, opening slightly as well, but also with articulation. So it's, it's a really cool sound, and uh, um, I try to use them sparingly. Um, I don't want to play every solo with it, well, I sort of do, but <laughs> um, uh, by, by sort of rolling those different colors into, into the palette musically, um, it keeps it interesting for me. Hopefully it keeps it interesting for the audience who's listening, and obviously for, for my bandmates as well. So again, the, the things that we're using, that Bill and I are both using, and, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit as well, um, uh, it's meant for a different sonic color uh, structure, um, a different listening experience for us. It forces us to play differently as well. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm using um, either the harmonizer or the Qtron, sometimes I'll use the whammy uh, uh, pedal as well. Uh, it, it makes me play differently because it's a different sound. It's like when I do the double horn stuff, I play differently because it's a different sound, and uh, which is which is pretty interesting to me. It's, it's exciting and interesting. Yeah, good question. What else? Yes, sir. He did an effect that sounded really like a baritone. He said I did an effect that sounded to him like a baritone, um, which they have some of those here. It was a, it was a, um, Eddie Harris sort of made the baritone famous. There was a piece on the top and, and a rod on the side that was um, basically electrified saxophone, and it was it was. Uh, basically a harmonizer sound, uh, and, and to sort of emulate that, I've got an even tied Eclipse unit that I'm running through, which is more of a guitar unit, um, but I can do different, um, um, different harmonizing uh, with that. And so the one that I've got on this right now is a fourth below, so it gives me um, basically an open fifth or an open fourth uh, with the instrument. So this is the regular tone. And this is with the harmonizer. And the, 
the one thing about using this kind of stuff, and, and with Bill as well, he can address some of this too, is the way that, that um, the speed with which it tracks. There are some harmonizers that as you play it, if you play quickly, it'll lag behind because it's processing the sound. The thing about the Eventide that I really like, the thing about these analog pedals, the Digitech Whammy pedal, the Line 6 stuff, is that it tracks very quickly. So for example, it's not, you hear it's not lagging behind at all. And so it gives me uh, every opportunity to play with it in that way. So if I'm trying to play something fast, I know it's going to be right there with me. If I'm trying to play something slow, obviously it's going to be there with me as well. But I have tried other units that don't track that quickly, and so there's a delay in the sound, and it seems very awkward to try to play like that. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yes, ma'am? Are any of you on faculty anywhere? Are any of us on faculty anywhere? Um, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> should be, thank you. Hire us. <laughs> um, we all teach um, in some form or another. Um, Bill probably teaches more than any of us. Uh, he's around the Boston area. Uh, Felix lives in New York. Jeff Seip lives in Brevard, North Carolina, right outside of Asheville. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, but we go around and we do a lot of these clinics also, working with kids, and that's sort of one of the outreaches that we do. Um, um, I think it's incredibly important. You know, I'm always talking about how important public uh, music education is and why it's important also. And uh, uh, I'd be preaching to the choir here, but you know, I think it's really important that, that we get out there and, and let people know why it's important, how it's important to us, um, why it's important to our kids. You know, get them involved also. Let them tell people why it's important to them. Um, but uh, eventually, you no, know, I would like to teach. I love teaching. I absolutely love it. And uh, my degree is actually in education from North Texas. And, uh, so I spent uh, a lot of time dealing with those um, um, possibilities of education, you know, throughout uh, my five years down there. Yeah, great. Yes, question right here. Yeah, the trumpet player, when he was soloing, it sounded like he had an echo there. The, the trumpet player sounds echoey? Yeah, no, he had an echo following his soul. He had an echo following his sound, yeah. Can, can you demonstrate that with the, echo, the delay that's following? And maybe talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's a, it's a sweep echo, and the unit is a, a Line 6 M9 stomp box modular. <laughs> I had to read that, and I'm, I'm not even sure what it is, but uh, I like this effect. It is um, a sweep echo, so you can um, actually play a little bit of a duet with yourself in your solo. Uh, the key to that is you've got to allow some time to pass before you play your next phrase. Uh, you have to turn the mic on for that, though. your mistake back to you as well. Here twice. That's what you want to hear? Was that? You want to know what that was? Yeah, yeah I just want to right. know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> While we're on the subject of, uh, of pedals also, let's, we'll talk about what we're running through as far as, um, uh, as, far as wireless units, um, how we kind of get into the pedals and out of the pedals also. Basically, we're both running um, shore wireless units. I've got um, um, uh, wireless. <laughs> it's a wireless mic. Um, it's, a, uh, it's, a D, uh, it's a DDA. And how they use them a lot for symphonies, um, uh, and it's fantastic. They've just started making these mics in the last couple of years. Um, Bill is using an AMT applied microphone technology, uh, microphone for him. We're both going into um, a couple of different units. My unit, I'm going into a, um, um, a blue tube um, preamp to boost the signal slightly to give it a little more warmth. Uh, from that, I'm going into um, um, my Qtron envelope filter. Out of my Qtron, I'm going into my Eventide. And from the even tide, I'm going into um, um, right into the board. Um, uh, through, I, I have a direct box actually that I go through as well to reduce the noise. For Bill, he's going from his Shure Wireless 
um, into a lexicon reverb unit, um, into the stomp box, into the Digitech. Actually, I guess you're going from the, uh, the short into the, into the pedals, from the pedals into the reverb unit, from the reverb unit to the board through a direct box. Um, so basically, if you're interested in getting into pedals and you're a horn player, talk to a guitar player or a bass player um, and mess around with some of those. Just get a 57 or a 58, something that doesn't need phantom power, and just start plugging into them. Go in through an amp and just see what you like. You know, see what sounds good to you. And uh, um, I highly encourage you to experiment with those things. The nice thing, I've got one of these M9s also at home that I just finally took out of the box. The nice thing about this, about the Line 6 unit, is that uh, it has all their pedals contained in one small unit. So you don't have to drag a whole lot of stuff around. And there's a lot of different sounds. Bill, can you just give, give some more examples of just the solo sounds on there? This will be the whammy pedal now, with one of the M9 effect sounds. Yeah, so he's experimenting with a whole lot of stuff over here. And uh, he's only really been getting into using these pedals for the last, what, year and a half maybe? Something like that? And uh, so it's, it's really changed the way that he plays also. It allows him to, uh, to really experiment with some different things. You feel it? Uh, you, you don't have your, your pedal on, right? No. Okay. Um, what is that usually? Uh, well, uh, shift, right? No, it's called the ring thing. It's a ring modulator. Oh. But it does, it does different Felix uses a ring modulator, what is it called the ring thing? Yeah. And uh, it's a ring modulator, it also does uh, some octave dividing, um, uh, bird sounds. So, uh, so everybody's kind of getting into some, some alternative uh, um, sonic textures with their instruments. And so again, it allows us to experiment with these sounds and, uh, and just try a bunch of different stuff, basically. And uh, it's a lot of fun for us, for sure. Um, so. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of written with the pedals. Any other questions about the pedals, about how we're going into it or anything like that? Um, how much do they cost? Huh? What's that? What's the cost of that? What's the cost? Well, I'll sell you his stuff for twenty bucks. <laughs> uh, it, it it varies, you know, depending on the pedal. Um, uh, I think that the M9 is around three hundred bucks. Um, the Whammy pedal, what around two, like one eighty-five, two hundred, right around there. Uh, the even side is probably the most expensive unit. I think that's around twelve hundred bucks. Um, you don't have to go with that high end of a unit. Um, uh, with microphones, I recommend getting a really good mic. Uh, sure makes a really good mic, and he makes a really good mic. Uh, DPA, that's what it says. DPA, yeah, uh, makes a really great mic. Also, I think this is the best thing. I know it's the best thing that I've ever played, by far. Um, I don't endorse them. Uh, they don't even have endorsers. Um, uh, they believe in their mics so much that they believe that people will play them because they love them, and uh, they're awesome, absolutely awesome. Um, so you know you can find used pedals also. Uh, the Qtron envelope filter is about maybe 125 bucks. Um, you know the stuff isn't terribly expensive, and, and again, there's a lot of used gear in the world, so you can go to a, a, a local store and find a lot of stuff or Craigslist, eBay, that kind of thing. But I, I definitely recommend. Uh, trying them out first, you know, again, if you have uh, friends that are guitar players or bass players, go over and try some stuff out and, and, and see what moves you and see what inspires you to play. Yeah. What else? Yes. question about uh, logistics of rehearsing with you guys being all over the place mm -hmm. and playing in bands and play all over the place. Do you rehearse on Skype? Do you rehearse on Skype? The question, which is... Yeah, Mark was asking about the logistics of, of rehearsing uh, with a group that um, everybody's from a different place. Uh, nobody in this group uh, lives in the, different pla in, in the same place. Um, 
Uh, so it's a challenge. It's, it's a definite challenge to um, build in repertoire in the group, which we've been doing recently, um, building in a lot of, or, or bringing in a lot of new tunes uh, to build that repertoire. So a lot of the work has to be done outside of the group. Um, I'll do my best to make sure that I'm sending MP3s, whatever charts I have. I have everything in Sibelius, um, so I'm at least able to send a lead sheet um, with chord changes that are mostly correct. We'll change them a lot. You know, Felix plays things differently almost every time. So it's sort of a guide. I mean, the piece of, there's no music on a piece of paper. You know, that's, that's sort of an important thing to remember also, that, that the music's not on the sheet of paper. The music's in you and the interpretation of what is there. You know, if you're reading Shakespeare, it's up to you to interpret Shakespeare how you perceive Shakespeare. If you're playing Miles Davis, it's up to you to interpret that piece of music how you choose to interpret it. And it's the same with this music here, um, that we get to interpret it the way that we choose to interpret it. So as far as rehearsing, a lot of times we'll rehearse at sound checks. Um, I'll try to bring everybody in a day early also. If we have to travel on a Tuesday, I'll try to bring everybody in on a Monday so that we have uh, a little rehearsal time. We have uh, a little hang time also. Um, and so that we're not getting there, trying to rehearse, and then going to the gig and being completely exhausted. So, uh, so we, try to, we try to roll that, and we listen to some in the van also. Um, but you know, we, we try to carve out um, as much time as we can, but it's a real challenge, for sure. It's a real challenge. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it happens. We don't use Skype, you know. We, <laughs> I wish we could, but uh, uh, it doesn't quite work that well for that. Um, but sometimes, you know, if we're traveling somewhere also, and, and uh, if we're driving the van to, to pick different people up along the way, once we get to the city we're going to, um, sometimes we'll go in for um, two or three hours earlier than what the load-in time is or the sound check time is, and we'll take that time to work on some new things as well. Kind of get reacclimated as well, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. it's a challenge though, for sure. Yeah. What else? Yes. Uh, I wish we could. We're actually going home tonight. Yeah, heading back to Nashville, and these guys are flying out early tomorrow. And uh, um, but we just played at the Oyster Bar maybe uh, three weeks ago, a month ago, something like that. And I uh, had a great time there. So we'll be back. We'll definitely be back. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we could. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So some other questions? Yes, sir. Why did saxophone players sell out to the drum machine people? Why did saxophone players sell out to the drum machine people? Thank you. I'm not really sure. <laughs> All right, drummer. Why did the saxophone players sell out to the drum machine people? I'm not sure he understands the question. talking about whenever you buy a CD of a great saxophone player they always have him backed up by a damn drum machine that's what I'm talking about oh so so when when different players use drum machines on the records that's all they do and they cut out the drummers and drummers are important that's very true actually yeah. drummers are very important absolutely and all I hear is drum machines from California California's evil <laughs> well, you know, I think that in, I think in certain styles of music, I think that, uh, like with any instrument, I think when the drum machine first came out, I think it was severely overused. Uh, just like MIDI keyboards, you know, when MIDI keyboards first came out, like the DX7, you would hear like the worst possible sounds on all these records. And I was wondering the same thing, where's the piano? You know, where's the Fender Rhodes, where's the Whirlis, or where, where's the organicness of what I think that, that you're speaking of? And uh, I love the drums. I absolutely love the drums. And I love this drummer back here also. He's a phenomenal player. Um, I can promise you that I'll never use a drum machine on any of my records. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, but I think that, that there's a lot of programming that goes on in certain styles of music, um, uh, which I don't really claim to understand that I know why that is. But I know that it occurs. And uh, um, just like in, in different situations, there are musicians that are being replaced um, by computers, essentially. You know, stuff that's been written out, that's being played by symphonies or, or horn stabs or whatnot. 
Um, I think sometimes it's it's a money issue. Sometimes I think that uh, they sort of lose the aesthetic of of what music really is and what it's about, uh, which is a communication, which is an organic uh, community of, of, of players getting together and um, sort of breaking apart something, you know, trying to get involved with, with each other in a relationship. And uh, so I, I think that um, I mean, there are relationships in everything. There's relationships with our computers as well. But the relationships that I prefer are the interpersonal relationships of, of communicating musically with people. Yes. And that's, that's where I'm at. So, uh, you know, you've got both thumbs up on that one for sure to, to be using live You musicians. saw what my question was. I understand now, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, I don't know if I have a really good answer for it other than it might be monetary. It might be uh, um, an aesthetic that they're going after in particular. Um, it's or not particularly my It might aesthetic. be California, too. It might be California, <laughs> okay. It might be California. All right, could be. Could be. you got to go watch out for those coasts. <laughs> Cool. What else? What else do you guys want to talk about? Yes, sir. It can be for anybody in the band also. Okay, I'm sorry, can you speak up just a little bit? Oh, absolutely. The question was, are we interested in playing unamplified music without effects? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And we do that quite a bit. Um, with an electric bass, it's a little difficult, obviously. Um, uh, Travel-wise, though, it's much easier to go with an electric bass than an acoustic bass. And, and a lot of times it fits this particular music um, better than not. But we love acoustic music. You know, I think that's what we all grew up playing as well. Um, this is just sort of another sonic palette that we're working from now. Um, um, but there's a lot of stuff on, on my records that's more acoustic in nature as well. Um, uh, you know, I love Dexter Gordon. And, Sonny Stead and Bird, Coltrane, Sonny Rollins, Wayne Shorter. I mean, all the beautiful acoustic music that, that um, came out of all these different styles of, of music that we sort of umbrella under jazz. And uh, Greg Warnett Coleman also, Joe Henderson. Uh, the list goes on and on, Train, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that music has been profoundly influential for us. And what we're trying to do, though, is also take sort of contemporary elements and roll that in with some traditional elements. Um, one of the things about having the two horns in the front is, is sort of that root of like Wayne Shorter and Lee Morgan or, uh, um, you know, Train and Miles or, or you know, that, that sound that exists there, but expanding it um, through the use of electronic, um, um, the electronic persuasion, I guess you might even say, of, uh, of trying different effects and things. Um, uh, Jeff Seip and I just put out a duet record, came out uh, the end of April. That's completely acoustic. We recorded with five microphones. We played for about two and a half days. And then uh, I went through and edited it down and sort of sewed these different parts together. And out of 12 hours of music, we put out a 46-minute CD. And uh, that's supposed to be listened to as one single piece. And it's, it's completely acoustic. It's called Duet. Yeah. It took a long time figuring out the name. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's on Compass Records. And uh, you can also go to jeffcoffin.com. You can listen to the whole thing. You can also uh, uh, download it from there. iTunes, the whole nine yards. Do you have to go back and learn it now? Um, <laughs> do we have to go back and learn it now? Well, yes, actually, there are certain parts we have to go back and learn. Um, yeah, there are certain places that we had sketched out little pieces of tunes. Um, but most of it was improvisational. A lot of times music, like we read in this country, we go from left to right. And a lot of times music is perceived that way also. It starts here, and it kind of goes this way, and then it's done. Or sometimes it goes to here, goes back to here, here, back to here, here, back to here, maybe to here, and then coda, and then we're done. But it's still sort of this left to right idea. So one of the things that, that we did on this duet record was that a lot of the music was being played that way, but it was also being played vertically as well as horizontally. And so it, it sort of had a different, almost like a three-dimensionality to the music. So maybe we went diagonally on this part, um, maybe we went this way or that way or backwards or so it sort of uh, uh, it sort of opened it up in a, in a in a unique way by thinking of it horizontally uh, as well as vertically so it. it's basically a 46 minute seamless piece of music it has index points so that you can hear uh, the beginnings of these different sections like if you go to track six you'll understand that that's sort of the beginning of the next tune but there are these transition points in the middle that are sewn in like a like a fabric 
there's a lot of listening that was done to, to sort of weed out certain things. What about playing it? Um, live, live? Well, we wouldn't play the whole thing live because a lot of it, most of it is improvisational. Um, but the little parts of it that are not, the little parts that are the actual tunes, we do, th we do that stuff as well. We do duet clinics um, uh, where we'll bring that stuff out and, and play that way also. There's a, uh, let's do, um, let's do a little, that one piece that we do. Um, we'll actually do a, a piece that's off the, uh, the duet record. We'll play the melody of it for you. And uh, this is a piece actually that you'll all know. melody of one of the pieces. How many people knew what that was? Really? I'll play one more time. Pledge of Allegiance, that's absolutely correct. Listen to it again and think of the words. Sometimes, you know, we're talking about different elements of music, and I think that phrasing is a really important part of music, and a part that, that sometimes can get lost in the academia of playing patterns and scales and et cetera, et cetera, just running up and down the horn. Um, when we speak, we speak in phrases. When we sing, we sing in phrases. When we play, we should be playing in phrases, using our breath, uh, using pause, uh, using dynamic elements. Um, one of the ways that, that I have young players practice also, um, and I highly recommend this, um, to work on articulation. There are many books on articulation, many studies and exercises um, to work on, on the articulation here. And if we think about what's going on when we speak, that the tongue is moving in all sorts of different directions in, in the mouth, uh, hitting all sorts of different places to enunciate different words, um, different dynamic levels also, if we whisper in, it's one thing. But if you're shouting, it's a whole different thing as well. Um, so thinking about these different elements as we're playing, too, is really important. One of the ways to learn about phrasing is to take a book, any book. It can be a book of poetry, it can be a newspaper, uh, it can be a phrase, and start playing that on the instrument. Uh, for example, give me a phrase, anything, any sentence. Put um, um, Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> All right, the Star Spangled Banner. I'm just going to take those words, the Star Spangled Banner. Give me another sentence, anything. Uh, one fly over the cuckoo's nest. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Something else. Give me another sentence. I don't have anything. 
You know, so you, you kind of get the idea of what's going on here. Again, you can take any phrase you want. You can write stuff down. You can take it out of a poetry book, a newspaper, a textbook, whatever you want, and start to phrase that way. Read it out loud, and then just start on one note. Uh, if I'm not really sure what to say, I'm not really sure what to say. So you start to get into the idea of, of phrasing something rhythmically as well. Okay. So you start to think, well, how would, I, how would I say that? So if you're playing a tune, if you're playing a ballad, if you're playing a, a swing tune, uh, a pop tune, rock tune, reggae tune, whatever it may be, you start to think in phrases as well. So when you're improvising, you're starting to think in phrases. As we speak, we're also improvising. We're trying to communicate, so that happens in phrases. Yes? Since you're improvising your melody, what key are you playing on? Uh, he said, since I'm improvising a melody, what key am I playing in? When I'm doing this particular exercise, I'm not thinking necessarily of keys. I'm thinking of more of a phrasing. Uh, I'm sometimes thinking intervallically. Um, you can think in one key if you want. Like if I was thinking in the key of C, um, and I'm not sure what to say. So you can start to think in those different keys, but for me, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to open myself up phrasing-wise, intervallically, um, thinking more of the phrase than the tonality, because that will allow me um, um, a little more freedom than sort of locking myself into one particular key or another. But you can definitely do it. You can compose that way also. That's a great way to compose, using one or two different keys and thinking about these phrasings within there. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yes? Playing those phrases, you mean? Yeah, or just improvising in general. He was wondering if, if it has to do more with modes um, rather than getting out of the tonality of, of, uh, of a certain sound. And for me, what I'm doing, again, when I'm doing this exercise, I'm not, I'm not trying to put any parameters on what I'm doing other than to play that phrase rhythmically. Um, I think rhythm and time are very important fundamentals to be working on. And a lot of times, we're surrounded by rhythm, but we're not surrounded by metronomic time. So that's one of the reasons why we have to use a metronome, is to learn to play in time with other players. Learning to control the instrument, learning to control the fingers, the embouchure, the tongue. But if I asked you what time signature I'm, I'm speaking in, it would be impossible to say. So when I'm thinking of phrasing, I'm trying to think outside of, of that box of 4-4 four, four, or 7-4 or whatever it may be. Um, so that I'm, I can be able to play over the bar line with it, so that the phrasings that I'm playing, um, even if I'm in a particular key, those phrasings are still extended and expanded from just, say, like a pattern of four notes. Uh, one of the things I do when, I, when I'm warming up also, one of the, um, the warm-ups that I have, and it's always, always with the metronome, is I'll do, um, I'll do groupings of fives on different scales. I'll usually do major, harmonic minor, and melodic minor. And so, so this is how I'll do those. And it forces me to articulate differently so that when I'm writing, when I'm playing, um, I start to play over the bar line. There. So, for example... So that's major. So if this was harmonic minor... And then melodic minor... So it forces me to sort of articulate differently as I'm playing these groupings of fives, up five, then down the next five, up five, down the next five. You can do groupings of sixes, sevens, fours, threes, whatever you want to do. Um, uh, so again, you can do combinations of those, both do a five and then a six, um, however you want to do it. You know, it all works. Um, so I'm trying to think on those, on those levels of, 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 again, sort of getting outside of, of that box. Um, um, it might be good to do that matter. To, to show some of this. There's a tune that we do that 
uh, is also in an, in an odd time signature. A number of these tunes, uh, most of the tunes that we end up playing are not in 4-4. I think there's I think there's one tune that's in four four all the way through. This tune is not that tune. <laughs> so these different phrasings idea these different phrasing ideas that that we're speaking of um, definitely come in handy in this tune as well. See if see if you can figure out if you don't know the time signature of this tune. Um, see if you can figure out it's called the Mad Hatter Rides Again. Thank <laughs> you. 